Hello, everyone. Today, Sons of Norway welcomes award-winning documentary filmmaker Margaret Olin to talk about her film, Songs of Earth. A bit of background on Margaret. She is a film director, screenwriter, producer, author, and lecturer based in Oslo, Norway. Originally from Stranda in Western Norway's Fjord country, she studied at the University of Bergen and Volda University College. Her films are mostly feature length documentaries focusing on topics that she is passionate about and would like to highlight for others. Margaret also works in, with theater and writes and directs fiction. She has received many national and international accolades for her work. Margaret Olin was named Norwegian of the Year in 2008 by magazine Miti, and two of her films have been Norway's submission to the Oscars, The Angel in 2010 and Songs of the Earth in 2024. Her film Doing Good from 2016 is the second highest grossing documentary ever in Norway. Songs of the Earth opened in September 2023 in Norway and will be coming to theaters in the U.S. and Canada in May. Thank you so much for joining me to talk about your latest film, Margaret. Thank you for having me and giving me this opportunity to talk about the film. Now, your first film debuted in 1994. Can you tell us uh, what drew you to becoming a documentary filmmaker? Yes, I think I have known since I was uh, six years old. I was out in the field looking at the sheep and writing my first sentence. And I run to my mother and she was very curious. What were the words coming to you? And I was, uh, you know, reading it to her. And then she said, now you can both read and write and we will keep on reading what you write. And it has been like that all my life that she was my first audience and was encouraging me to finding my own voice at a very early age. So I have known that I was a storyteller since I started to read and write, but I didn't know that I was supposed to be a filmmaker. That came later, but uh, mm, I applied to a school where you could uh, study to be a journalist or an author, or you could go down the road to become a filmmaker. And then I thought to myself that I can do writing and I can read books and I can train myself to write, but uh, I, I here I have the possibility to learn a craft, to become a filmmaker. And then after three weeks, uh, I, I knew that film was my first language. <laughs> So, and since then I, uh, I have been doing all these films, so I, I think that is right for me. And your films shine a light on human experiences and often feature misunderstood figures who have been sidelined from society. What drives you to amplify the voices of outsiders? Mm. That has also to do with my mother, in fact, and and, and uh, me growing up, uh, the, the youngest brother of my mother, Raida, he had Down syndrome. And uh, that was decisive for her life, for my mother's life, and of course for his life. He was born in 1950 and he didn't have the right to go to school at that time. And he was sent to an institution when he was 11. My grandmother thought that he would be protected if he was by his own, sort of, that there he could learn something. And um, so at one point, when I was around eight years old, I, I had this experience of people looking at my uncle as something was wrong with him. I hadn't thought about it, but until that day, when I was together with my uncle, we were surrounded by family and everyone loved my uncle. But at that time, we were going by bus, my uncle and me, one hour, hour drive by the fjords uh, where I come from. And people coming 
on the bus and or getting off the bus, they did the same. They turned and looked at him as there was something wrong about him. And those, yeah, the way they looked at him, that really hurt me. And he saw that. And then he whispered to me, you know, I am not like the others. And I was thinking to myself, no, you're better. And one day I will tell them. So since then I had this need to one day tell his story or portraying him. And later, I, when I went to my education and learned how to be a filmmaker, my first film was called My Uncle. So I, I did that. I, yeah. So, and I think that later in life that I didn't decide when I became a filmmaker that I was to tell the story, stories of outsiders. But I've, I've always been thinking that what moves me uh, or what I get touched by will also touch you. And because of my uncle, I think that when I meet people that uh, feel that they don't have a place in society or at a certain school or among others that that really speaks to me and I feel that I have an access to this and can be the right person to tell their stories. So this is how it happened that I became that kind of storyteller. But uh, my last films, I have made other films too, focusing more on like I made a film called Childhood about children playing for one year and that we need uh, or children need to be allowed to play. So before I have been focusing more on what is not working in our society, trying to shed light on it and raise awareness and public debates about it. And that has happened a lot. Um, but uh, I also now have started to make films where I show what works in society, uh, maybe to inspire. We live in a time where there are a lot of uh, difficult stories to, um, uh, yeah, what can I say? It's, um, I think that we need hope more than I did before in our times. I do. Thank you for that powerful answer. Um, your new film, Songs of the Earth, has been described as the strongest nature experience of the year and also a spectacular embrace of your first love, of our first love, nature. What made you to decide to make this film? Yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, I I feel that I should say that I wanted to make this film for all all the um, Norwegian Americans to see this film of home <laughs> and now decide to move home. <laughs> but uh, it's not only like that. But since I started to make this film, you know, uh, many people in my father's family and in my mother's family they emigrated. They went to the U.S. and uh, I've always had this dream that this film will be released uh, in the United States and hopefully a lot of people having their ancestors in Norway, from this part of Norway, uh, can watch this film and rediscover the nature and the culture where their ancestors come from. So I really hope they will see this film. But I have known for years that one day I will go home and make a film about the landscape of home. And then I do not only mean the landscape surrounding us, but I think that the landscape outside also uh, is decisive for the landscape within. If you grow up, by the fjords and the mountains in Norway. And the first words that you are taught, if they are mountain, glacier, lake, waterfalls, wood, 
woods, that the language will place the surroundings or will place the landscape within you. And I grew up in a very dramatic and beautiful landscape. And the premise for this film is in the battle between power, man, and the powerful nature, the powerful winds. Nowadays, there are made a lot of documentaries about climate change and the nature crisis. And they are hard to watch, a lot of them, bringing facts to the table by scientists and journalists and politicians and activists. And of course, these are very, very important films and what we can read about the nature and climate crisis also. But for me, I wanted to have another approach to it. I wanted to make a love letter to nature and a love letter to my parents because I want the audience to have the opportunity to reconnect. I believe that nature is our home and that when you are like going outside is to go in and deep within we all carry this knowledge that we are a small part of a bigger whole and that brings humbleness that also bring respect for all other life forms so i wanted to make this love letter to to be a reminder and the way it has been received in in the nordic countries and in europe and now it will be released in the us as well is telling me that um, the longing that i have been carrying since i moved from home I share that with so many people um, that we need to be more out in nature. So this is one part of why I made this film. There is also, there is always uh, several answers to this because making a documentary like Songs of Earth, it takes three years. Uh, so I also had this deep personal reason for making the film and that was that um, I wanted to spend the time with my parents in one way hoping to understand even more of my father. We have always been very close in my family uh, but also that I feel that the time that we have together is getting shorter and shorter and that um, I have always been so afraid of losing them and in a deeper sense making this film I think I I thought that it might will would prepare me in a way when that day arrives so that was the really, really personal reason for make for making the film. And for this film, you lived and walked literally in the steps of your 84 year old father for an entire year to better understand him. And how did that play out on a practical level? What was the routine for you and also your crew? Um, I'm assuming that they've also followed both of you for the, that year. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I went home and I I asked my father if we should do the walk. Something happened in my life that uh, was um, devastating. And before this, and uh, then I went home to my parents and said that I don't know how to live my life anymore. And I had... Uh, a lot of anxiety because um, I can tell very shortly, but my, my man, uh, I was 45 and he was 47 and he had a major stroke. And that happened like um, without any warning. And, you know, life, as you know, it changed in a split second. And we have to, had to redefine who we were to one another and his life and my life. And that was, um, yeah. I, I didn't see that coming like at that age and, and and then always 
to my father when I have asked him something in life and his answer to everything has been, let's go for a walk. So when I told him this, he said, we, we, we should go for a walk, but to help you how you are going to live your life, I think we should walk for one year. And, but then when COVID came, Corona, uh, I called him and said that maybe we should do, start walking now. And he said, yes. And I said, can I bring my crew? And he also said yes, and, and I had talked to my mother before that, we talked about everything and if she wanted to participate, even though this was going to be a film of my father and walking in his footsteps, I can't make a film about my father's first love, nature, without bringing in his biggest love, my mother. So she had to be a part of it too, and she said yes, and then uh, every second month we walked and filmed and uh, during the four seasons and in Norway we really have four seasons, you know. So, uh, and then we spent time home with my crew. We were, we had two photographers, one the main photographer and the drone photographer and then one that did um, field recordings with sound. Um, so we stayed at a farm uh, in Olderdalen and uh, we walked and we filmed and we we were thinking about what we did that we were not like creating the images, we were collecting them, that all the gifts given us by nature we were collecting and it was the same with the sound. Um, I have to tell you a short story, and that was the first time my father brought me to the glacier, Justedalsbreen, it's called in, Nor in Norwegian, Justedalen Glacier, that's the biggest inland glacier in Europe, and it's beautiful, it has its long strong arms down the, the mountains, um, and a lot of tourists coming to this area. But the last years, uh, the, the last 20 years, the, the glacier is melting. So now it's high up in the mountain before the beautiful glacier branches was down on the lake, like coming all the way down to the lake in, in, in the valley. So, but, and it was like that when I was five years old, my father brought me to the glacier for the first time. And we were sitting by the front of the glacier and then the wind came through the valley. And the sound of the wind, when that hit the glacier and turned into the crevasses, the sound of the wind, wind turned into tones and it sounded like music. So I asked my father, is there an orchestra playing down there in the depths? And he answered, can you hear them too? And I think that since then I have been collecting sounds and images within me. Um, and so I thought, is it possible to, if we lower that microphones down into the, the depths of the glacier to capture these tones, and it was, and we play them to musicians, transforming them into music, which instrument was the best to play the wind inside the glacier uh, or the wind in the big spruce of the film. And then um, I had my composer, uh, Rebecca Cario, I've been working with her for 15 years and she's brilliant and she wrote a score and we went to Air Studio in London and, and the music is performed by London Contemporary Orchestra. Yeah, that was a long answer to the question, but yeah, that was the whole arc of the how we worked with the sound, but yeah. Fantastic. Um, I've also read that uh, thousands of hours of footage got distilled down into the 90 minute film. Um, how did you go about crafting the story when working with that vast amount of content? Yeah, we knew that, uh, or we walked with my father for, the plan was to 
the plan was to work behind my father's back during four seasons. But when winter came and we had been walking through winter, my father said, let's keep on walking. After every winter, there is a new spring. And um, so I knew that we wanted to uh, have sequences in the film that was each season. And every season has its colors and its different feelings. I was thinking that spring is my father's childhood. And he said, think about spring as your childhood and remember to smell the flowers like you did as a child. And then we had summer, thinking of summer as his youth with the abundance of colors and sound and animals and insects and flowers. And, and also summer allows us to walk on the glacier and the waterfalls coming out of the glacier, they were enormous, you know, because of the melting. So summer was really the abundance like youth is in our lives. And then you have autumn with rain and the mists and coming, sliding down the, the mountainsides and disappearing as quickly. With all its, like autumn, with all its sudden shifts, thinking of my adult life with all its sudden shift and what happened to me in my life. And then my father said that the movement of the surface is not who you are, it's deeper. So it will come and it, it will go. And then winter came and winter was old age, quiet and ease. And um, it's only four colors left in winter in the valley. It's black and white and gray and blue in the glacier like really deep blue. It's kind of a graphic landscape. But what I saw during winter, you know, when the snow came and it's only like two centimeters of snow. And then you look up in the mountainside and you can still see in black the traces, the path that have been shaped by our ancestors. For generations, they have been walking the mountains and then I had this calm, or I felt like going from fear to acceptance, to thankfulness that I suddenly saw that my father's footprints have left their mark as well. And that he will always be a part of this landscape. And then I started to think that we needed to film his skin and let it melt into the glacier. Um, so I think that how to build a film like this, you, you, give, you give color and meaning and rhythm to each season. That is how the film is, um, is played out. Like we start in spring and then we end in spring again, like the fifth season. But people should see the film <laughs> to see how, why, why we decided to, to film another spring. And that was the idea of my father. And he does something in the new spring that says something about him as a person, I think, and what his father and grandfather meant to him. Um, but I worked with an editor. Uh, Mikal Leslowski. He's born in Poland. He lives in Stockholm. Misha is in his 70s. He has uh, been editing one of the most beautiful films made in, in Sweden and in Europe the last years. Uh, the first film he edited was uh, The Sacrifice by Tarkovsky. And Misha is like my sound designer and my photographers and Rebecca, an artist in himself. And I couldn't have made this film without all of my crew. And uh, Misha is bringing his deep thoughts and reflections into, um, into the editing room. And we talk a lot about what we are doing and why we are doing it.
and that is how we are developing uh, how this story will unfold. So it's more a team effort with the crew that you had, plus um, collaborative editing. Yes, um, all in all, there are nine photographers on this film. I had my director of photography, Lars Arland Oimo. He's younger than me. And this was the first time he was filming nature. And that was very important to me because there are so many talented and brilliant nature photographers out there. But I really wanted us to make a film uh, that is as we see nature for the first time. Because I wanted the audience to feel that. Like, yeah, you Norwegians, of course, they, they live in different parts of Norway. They have been to the fjords and also people from abroad, or they have their, their own nature close to them. But how can we um, photograph nature bringing a feeling that, oh, I see this for the first time. So I wanted to work with a photographer that didn't, alre didn't already have a language for how to film nature. And I worked with, with Lars before, and I think he's very, very talented and beautiful human being as well. So, but in addition to him, we had two drone photographers. We had one filming from helicopter. We were allowed to fly over the plateau of the glacier for three hours only. Uh, and then we had a diver that is also a photographer. We were filming uh, in a lake where there was a big landslide in 1906 and 1936, uh, where a lot of people lost their lives. Uh, and then um, I had three wildlife photographers filming game and birds. There are eagles and other game and wildlife in, in these areas. Uh, and we can wait for that to happen. So I needed wildlife photographers that were um, experienced and, and knew how to, to get those images. So they worked not with the main crew, but uh, alongside us. Mm -hmm. mm. So the Norwegian title of the film is Fedre Lande, or the Fatherland. And then in English, it is Songs of Earth. Can you talk a little bit about the slightly different focus of the two titles? Yes, I can. Um, I think, as I told you before, about the, the experience of being with my father uh, at the glacier and hearing the sound of the wind turning into tones and music. And I have been, the English title came to me um, at once, like that I wanted to capture the songs of the earth. And I also think that we need to listen to Earth herself and the stories she tells or the tales of the wildlife to understand what is happening, how we are losing nature as we know it. Um, so, and abroad, I think that that resonates with people all over, like globally. Uh, but in my own country, I called it uh, Fedrelande, the land of the fathers. And that has to do with that this is a film that is very locally based. It is local, but still global. It is timely, but timeless. It is very personal, but it resonates with people all over. So I wanted it to have a local title for people in Norway that they feel that, okay, finally we have a film about our land. <laughs> like, 
So that's why I had two different titles. Mm. And kind of along those same lines, are there any specifically Norwegian themes that are in this work? Mm, what do you, can you explain more what you think about that? Um, are you drawing on Norwegian culture um, in the um, piece or, yeah, yes. history? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. yes, I am. Um, you know, um, my mother is singing some local songs specific for this area, written by local um, songwriters, poets that have been uh, songs that she was taught by her father and he was taught by his father, like from generation to generation. And these are songs that are highly appreciated. And we have songs for specific for this valley and this area of Norway. There are songs that um, is from the north of Norway and of course the south. So, and these, my mother, when I was small, and this book is still there, but she has a, a song book where she wrote down all the songs that her father used to sing for her. And a long, long time after, or for all her life, she talked about that she could hear her father singing within her. So it was very crucial for me to have her to sing in the film. And my father isn't a singer, so but he loves the songs too. So he he's um, he's speaking them like, and I put their voices together. She's singing and he's reading the poems or the the, the lyrics of the songs. Uh, and also, in addition to that, my father is telling the stories from the valley and from his ancestors, bringing to life, uh, how, how it was to live in a valley like Oldedal for the previous generations. And Oldedal is the place on earth where people live closest to a glacier all over. Um, yeah, there is no other place on earth where people live that close to a glacier. So uh, for people, in the US looking at this film that haven't been to this place in Norway, uh, but might have their ancestors there, they will get a strong feeling of how it was, the life in the valley. Mm. Wonderful. Um, what are you hoping that audience will take away from this film? Mm. Feedback that we have received um, is that I want to stay more. This is my cat, Isabel. <laughs> She's lovely. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. People have been saying that I want to spend more time outside. I want to buy new sneakers. I have been thinking that I don't have a body anymore that is can manage to walk in the mountains, but your father is 84 and uh, I can't walk like him, but I could, I could still try. Um, um, a lot of people um, are, are very touched by the family story in the film, the re relationship I have to my parents and the relationship between my parents and reflecting about the time they want to spend with their parents if they're my age, mm, the conversations that they haven't had with their parents or they wish they had had, like that. So. I feel that people are very honest and sincere getting feed, getting coming with feedback about this film. But what I really hope is that um, the audience can resonate and feel the love to planet Earth.
that's why the film is made. We need to take better, better care of it. Mm. And then um, how did the making the film impact your own life or did it change the way that you see the world? Yes, um, you know, when you when you walk in steep mountains, you, your focus has to be here and now. Uh, so what happened when I started to walk uh, with my father the, was that the images from the hospital that I was carrying with me night and day, what happened to my, my boyfriend, it left me, my personal, personal problems and challenges left me and my focus was here and now, I had to be present. Uh, the weather can change very suddenly high up in the mountains. So, and so I was like, I felt that I could breathe again. And I also felt that uh, I transcended above thought and that this endless space opened up inside me. Like maybe, People can feel that if they meditate or if people are out in nature and that the energy that are in nature, like when the sun is warming the, the rocks and the mountains and you are going in these narrow valleys and you can really feel it. Or for example, when we crawled under and inside the blue ice caves in the glacier, looking up on the ceiling uh, as, as I was on the bottom of the ocean, looking up on what appeared to be fish or galaxies, planets, stars. It, it was like the most, most beautiful forms and shapes I've ever seen in my life. And I was thinking if the glacier comes down and this will be my ice coffin, it's okay because I haven't seen anything like this. So this deep, experience of being in nature, I was so taken by it. But what happened was that I started to sleep again and that the anxiety left me. So I really felt that my father has been giving me this huge, enormous gift. And then when I talked about the seasons before and that in winter, we could see the path in the, the landscape formed by our ancestors. It, it was like seeing the blood vessels of the earth. And then when my father insisted that we should keep on walking and walking another spring, what I was thought by him is that there will, after every winter, there will be a new spring. So life is bigger than death, you know, because in winter everything is like the lake is frozen, the waterfalls are frozen, the colors are, aren't there anymore, and, and then suddenly you have life again. So in that way, the fear that I had starting out on this walk kind of was replaced by, by gratitude. And the very strange thing Life is strange and it gives us challenges that we didn't know could happen. But what happened was that the 5th of August, we had 10 outdoor screenings from south to north of Norway, on the mountain, in the woods, uh, on an island in the sea, in the south, inside a cave, in the north because you have the sun all, all through the night, you know. Uh, by the glacier, on the roof of the Oslo Opera House, that was the screening in Oslo. This was at the same time, 11 o'clock in the evening, the 5th of August. And me and my parents, we were in Oldedal, in my father's valley, together with 600 other people. And it was one of the most beautiful evenings of our lives, you know, all the people finally they got to see the film. My parents had of course seen it before and family and friends coming up, hugging them and they loved the film. And then 
some hours later that night we went after we had come home to the farm and my f parents went to bed and my mother woke up and felt she didn't feel well and she fell to the floor and she had this um, stroke oh wow. so that was uh, you know um, me and my mother went by helicopter to to the nearest hospital in Bergen and she died two days later oh. um, and that and you know my mother was driving her car and she was 78 and we didn't see that coming uh, and at first I thought that we had to postpone everything that had to do with the film that I wouldn't be able to like travel with the film or screen it to an audience one month later when it would be released in cinemas all over Norway. But I made it up to my father to decide. And he, after some weeks, he said that it will be harder for you if we close down everything now and you should take, take it up again in some few months. Your mother is here and she's with you. And if she's up on the screen too, it will do no harm. Maybe it will be good for us. So we, we went through with the plans that we had. And he also said that if your mother was here, she would never allow you to not screen the film. Um, and he came with me to the premiere in Oslo and the biggest theater. And he went to the stage and he talked about my mother. So in one way, he kind of saved me doing that. Um, so, and then I realized that, you know, you can't prepare for losing your mother or losing your father. That is impossible. But having done this film and having talked with them about death and that I am so afraid of losing them. And in the film, my mother says, this will be a spoiler then. But in the film, my mother says that she prays to go first because my father He's her rock, and she can see herself without him. And uh, this was how it became. But I didn't, I couldn't in my wildest dreams see that she would go on the night of the premiere of the film. Um, yeah. So sorry to hear of that. And, um, it kind of makes it such a moving and significant work if you go into it knowing that it is in advance. Yes, yes. So, yeah, because what we have in life, it's so precious. And and really the film is about that. The gift I, gifts I have been given by my parents, the love they have had to their parents and to their family, and that they have had to me, uh, and and making a film about that, and reminding us about that, and reminding us also that nature is our home, and if we don't take care of each other and don't take care of nature, we don't have what we need to to be on on this planet. <laughs> so so uh, yeah. In the credits, I saw that Liev Ullman is one of the executive producers of your new film. And I'm wondering how that relationship came about and um, how that process has gone. Yes. Yeah. You know, Liev, she's, um, she's one of my heroes. <laughs> she has been for many years. Like, um, I love her work, both as a director and actress, of course. Um, and I have met Lee during the years, but uh, she has also worked with my editor, uh, Misha, and he has been editing most of uh, Lee's films. So they're close friends. And at one point in the editing, uh, we had to decide who should be the first one to see the film in the editing room. It was not still in its final shape, and we needed someone that could 
picture uh, the potential of the movie, but still be honest to, with us to say how we should go on. And we decided to invite Leib. And I will always remember that moment after the film was finished. She was, <laughs> she was sitting like um, on the tip of a of her chair, and she was, um, yeah, filled with light. That is how she appears. And 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 she was saying some very honest things about the film, but she also really loved it. And that was important for me to, to feel that support. And then we talked about it and she, and she wanted to come on board as an executive producer, meaning that she um, attached her name to the film and, and help us with the, yeah, saw another cut of the film, uh, speaking her mind. And she came to the premiere in Oslo and in Trondheim, where she grew up and then when we were in the Oscar race, we didn't make it to the final nomination, but uh, we had screenings in the US and she was with us in New York at one of the screenings and had a Q&A with me. So she has been really supportive, both in the making, in the editing of the film, but also in the launch of the film. How special. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> So what's coming next for Songs of the Earth and um, what's coming up for you next? Mm. Yeah, these days the film is um, uh, at cinemas in Denmark and uh, in the Netherlands. It will uh, be soon in Italy and in the US and in Canada and in Japan and in Czechia and in Slovakia. <laughs> and in Portugal and Spain and yeah, a lot of other countries and um, it has been screened on BBC and Arte in France. So it's it's making its way out uh, on different continents in, and in the world. And I'm really grateful for that. And I am developing two new films, one fiction and one documentary, but it's too early to start to speak about it yet. Yeah. But um, hopefully it will be a film that also can be released in the US, so we will see. Wonderful. We're always looking for interesting content, especially with the Norwegian cultural themes and landscape. Yes. Um, and is there anything else that you'd like to mention that I didn't ask? Hmm. No, I think we have covered it. I am, I am very grateful that Strand releasing is, um, yeah, releasing the film in the U.S. and that uh, people have the opportunity to see it at cinemas. It it is really made for the big screen, uh, both visually but also sound-wise. So, um, yeah. If you go to see the film and you like the film, come home to Norway to visit or reach out to us and let us know what you think. Well, I'd like to thank you for sharing your experiences and such a movie, moving story today with our members. And I wish you and Songs of the Earth a successful run, especially in North America. Thank you. So thank you for taking the time, Margaret. And Songs of the Earth opens May 24th in theaters in North America. You can check the details accompanying this video um, and links below to the showtimes. Thanks so much again, Margaret. Thank you, thank you.